Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, it's good to be back with you. Um, just got back on uh, the ground just about less than 48 hours ago from London. Uh, there were eight of us that had the opportunity to go on behalf of this church, but also on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ to bear the good news of Jesus uh, to many who did, do not know him, may have never even heard his name. And we're going to talk about that today. Let me open up, I encourage you to open up your Bibles. We're in Luke chapter 24 today, the end of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we, when we went to London, uh, we were th there for a couple of reasons. Uh, to, we sort of had a two-pronged missional approach that, what, that we what, what we were there for. One, uh, you've been knowing about this for some time. We we're supporting a church planter. Uh, he and his family in a church in West London, an area of West London known as Shepherd's Bush, and we are supporting and working with. Uh, Dave and Anna Seckington. Dave is the pastor of a church that is launching this fall called Shepherd's Church. Isn't that appropriate? In Shepherd's Bush, uh, the Shepherd's Church is about to launch. And so we're, we went there to encourage them, to support them, to engage in some mission outreach with them, alongside of them. But also, we're partnering uh, with the International Mission Board. We have an International Mission Board missionary by the name of Scott Belmore, um, who, uh, uh, interestingly enough, we met... When he was serving in Alaska, uh, he has now been called to serve with our International Mission Board. He is working with university students uh, in London. And uh, the, just to give you an, the, the enormous weight of responsibility that he and his team have, get this, there are 500,000 university students in London. All right? More people in Metro Ocala are attending college or university uh, there in London, and we only have five people from our International Mission Board who are serving on that team trying to reach a half a million people, one person for every 100,000 students. And so we had an opportunity to partner with Scott and to do some work on one particular uh, university campus. It was an incredible experience uh, to see what the Lord is doing there and so it was a pretty awesome uh, trip, uh, engaging and then seeing the lostness that's there in the London. Uh, and let me also tell you, I had a couple of pretty cool experiences while I was there. Uh, one, uh, we, we took a little bit of a Christian heritage tour uh, before we got engaged in our mission work. And so we were understanding and learning about the worldwide mission and how it began. Many, uh, much of the modern missionary movement actually began in London. Uh, and it was along that tour uh, that we entered into the church that John Newton had pastored for many years. If you don't know the name John Newton, you probably know of a little song that he wrote called Amazing Grace. Anyone you heard that song? Uh, we, well, as a part of that tour, we stopped in that church that he once pastored, and I had the privilege of standing in the pulpit of John Newton and reading scripture, and so that was a pretty awesome moment. Uh, there was another thing that happened also just b with me. Uh, we had had a really big outreach night, uh, outreach day one day, and we took a little bit of time off to rest uh, the following morning, and while most everyone in our group was recovering, if you know me, I don't like to sit for very long, and so I just got out and and, and did a little bit of touring. I went to uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon's church. I just wanted to see that. And then on my way back to the flat where we were staying, uh, I stopped off at Buckingham Palace, just sort of passing by. And I, I kid you not, just as I was passing by, they, they said that a, a procession was about to happen, that the emperor of Japan was coming to make a state visit. And so I was like, cool, I'm going to stand here and get a picture of the emperor of Japan. And just as he began to pass by, I realized, that he wasn't alone, that King Charles was in a, in a carriage, and then right after him, Camilla came in a second carriage, and then in the third carriage, Prince William. And I was the only one from my group that got to see it, all right? <laughs> That's why you pray, people. Pray up. The Lord will bless you from time to time. Let me tell you, listen, as cool as that was, uh, to be able to stand in John Newton's pulpit and to read scripture from John Newton's pulpit uh, and, to, and to see in the flesh uh, the King of England and the Prince of England, that was by far not the most significant things that happened. Let me, let me tell you what really was significant about this trip. What was significant for me in that trip was, was watching a group of Christians gathering together. Uh, they're a fledgling church, the Shepherd's Church, uh, feeling the, the call of the Lord to be there in that community. By the way, Shepherd's Bush is 99.6% lost. 
Less than 4%, they're estimating, less than 4% of the people in Shepherd's Bush are believers in Jesus Christ. All right? keep, this, keep in mind that Shepherd's Bush, a part of London, in West London, is in the city where uh, part of the, the modern missionary movement was launched. People in London, they're they're surrounded by churches that were once led by some of the most evangelistic, missionary-minded pastors the world has ever seen, and yet London is one of the most lost places on the planet these days. And yet there is a group of people known as the Shepherd's Church that see that the the community that they are now living in is their mission field. That's one of the more significant moments for me, that they are not fading back, they're leaning in to the mission moment. I'll tell you another significant moment for me was watching our team going door to door on an estate. Now, just so you know, an estate in England is not the same as an estate in the United States. An estate in England is what we would sort of call the projects, government housing. And our team in groups of two going door by door, knocking on doors and extending an invitation to show up a couple of days later uh, to, to watch England play in a Euro soccer match in a, in a gathering uh, at, a, at a local community center that the, the Shepherd's Church was hosting. And we extended a thousand invitations almost to the community. And nearly a hundred people showed up for this event so that the Shepherd's uh, Church could engage the the, the people in relationships throughout that that soccer match as we we had hot dogs that we provided for them and we loved on them and served on them and greeted them. That was one of the most significant moments for me to see our people, people that are sitting among you right now, willing to step out in faith and, and, and engage the lostness around them. That same group then the next, a couple of days later, we're standing out in front of the, one of the largest malls in, in all of Europe, engaging people in gospel conversations. That's far more significant what they were doing in talking about the King Jesus than the king that came in front of me in a, in a carriage the, the day before. And, and also to, to see Scott Belmore, our, our missionary to the IMB. Let me, let me give you a little bit of background about his story uh, that was so significant. We were in a Bible study on the campus of Brunel University, and, and there were about 70 people gathered in the room. Some of them were Americans. Many of them uh, were a part of mission groups, some mission teams. Uh, but there was also a, a large group of, of, uh, of students, university students, many of which do not believe in Jesus sitting around Scott Belmore as he opened up the Bible and had a Bible study talking about Jesus Christ as they walked chapter by chapter through the book of John. If, if you know the fuller story of what happened with Scott Belmore, and when he arrived in, uh, nearly two years ago and he began to go onto that same campus uh, in Uxbridge and began, was trying to share the gospel, trying to have gospel conversations, some of the, the local school officials got wind of what he was doing and they banned him from being on the campus. It was only through the working of the Lord Jesus Christ where he began to uh, open some doors so that Scott could become the chaplain of the university's rugby team that now Scott has the run of the campus. And, And not only are they allowing him on the campus, they're allowing him to use a room on the university campus every Thursday night to share Jesus through a Bible study. I'm telling you, folks, the Lord is at work in this world. Amen? Some incredibly significant things that I saw, including one particular young man, he was of of Indian descent, who had been raised to be a Hindu. I was introduced to him there on the campus, and he just beamed as he began to explain to me how he was once lost in his sins, but through the ministry of, of this work, this university work and this Bible study, he has renounced his former beliefs. He is now a follower of Jesus Christ. And with a the, with the gleam in his eye and a smile on his face, he was telling me, I cannot wait to get baptized into the local church. Isn't that an awesome thing? And as I was thinking through all of this and reflecting upon uh, the the trip, and I'm thinking, you know, none of this would have happened, none of it, if if it weren't for those who were willing to go, who were willing to to leave their their comfort, to leave their immediate context, and to go to an uncomfortable place, to go and to share the good news of Christ. None of it would be possible unless someone said yes to going. 
You know, our God is ascending God. I don't know if you're aware of that, but if you read Scripture long enough, you'll become quite aware is that our God is not one who sits still. But he is a God who is on the move. He was on the move in sending his son to come to to die for us, to redeem us. But he was also sending others, those who had professed faith in Christ. He was sending them to go. Our God is a sending God. He has sent others. And guess what, church? He is sending you. He is sending me. And we must be willing to go. It's his heart as a sending God. And it should be our heart. And his heart is that we should go. And that's really the, the, the perspective of this passage of Scripture that we're going to read. So I'm going to encourage you, if you have your place in Scripture, to go ahead and open up your Bible and stand with me, as is our tradition. And we stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. You follow along as I read this. Here's the Word of God. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. We have a sending God who is sending his people to go. The question is, will you go? But before you do that, I want you to consider why we go. So would you pray with me? Lord, I'm grateful for your word as always, but especially now, as you've reminded me yet again, as after stepping off of a mission field that's far away and stepping back onto the mission field that is very near, this community, that, Lord, you are ascending God and that you're sending us to go, to be a people who are willing to go. Lord, sometimes we act like we're a people who have arrived, that we have reached our final destination and that we're just biding our time But Lord, you've not saved us that we would remain the same and that we would stay, but that you have saved us and you have redeemed us that we would be your missionaries wherever you've called us to go. And so Lord, I pray that you would challenge us today to see that the mission field is not far away. In some cases it is, but Lord, it is also very near. And that all of us have been called to go and to bear witness of your gospel to tell of the goodness of our God and what he has done to save us, to redeem us. Challenge us with this, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We often think of the Great Commission as that which occurs at the end of Matthew chapter 28. And it's true that the most famous location of the commissioning of the disciples is at the end of, of that book. But It's not the only place that the Great Commission is described. It's, in fact, described in each of the Gospels. And what we've just read just a moment ago here from Luke chapter 24 is a part of that same scene. And the word that is revealed there is this, that our God has a heart for the nations. He doesn't want the Gospel just to be in Jerusalem, but He wants the Gospel to extend to the the ends of the earth. He wants to see the peoples of the earth to come to a saving knowledge of him. The Apostle Paul affirmed this when he made this statement in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And this is why he commands us and encourages us to go, to take our gospel to the, to the nations, to take the gospel to our neighborhoods. And so today, I want to share with you, based on the words of our Savior here in Luke chapter 24, why we are to go. And the three reasons why, based on his his instructions here, his his challenge here. And here is the first. The reason why we go is we, we go because we have a message to proclaim. You know, we're not just about going. We, we did a little bit of sightseeing when we were in London. We, we encourage when you go on a trip to, to get an understanding and appreciation of, of, of a culture. And, but we don't go to be sightseers. It's not a tourism trip. 
We go because we have a purpose. We have a message that we are to proclaim. And the message that we are to proclaim is the gospel. It is the good news. You see, the gospel was God's message from the very beginning. He set this world in motion. He created man. He created woman. He created humanity along with the rest of creation and placed us in the midst of creation, giving us the the freedom and opportunity to know God, to, to love Him, to worship Him. We also know, as the Bible tells us, that Satan stepped into human history, tempted man into sinning, and this led the first human beings to be separated from God when they succumbed to the temptation, sinned against God. In that moment, it seemed that that Satan had spoiled God's plan, but we also know that God is God and that he was still in control, and though we had failed him, though we had rebelled against him, God was not surprised by it. And ultimately, his plan was made complete in Jesus Christ, who came to redeem us. The Old Testament spoke often of his coming, as Jesus indicates in verse 44. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You see, those words were fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the good news that the Old Testament was talking about. And note how he spoke about it in the scriptures. Again, verse 45, it says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures when he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. You see, here is the gospel that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, God's perfect and only son would suffer dying upon the cross and upon dying upon the cross, he would pay the penalty of our sin. But that wasn't the end of him. He was resurrected, proving that he was who he said he was and proving that he came to do what he said that he was coming to do, making forgiveness of our sins possible. But also note this, that it requires repentance on our part, on the part of the sinner. When the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and we recognize that we have offended a very holy God and that we deserve to die for our sins, we come under that conviction and recognize that we cannot keep going our way. And so we repent of that, turning from our sin and our way and turning to him for the forgiveness of our sins. Friends, this is the gospel. This is the good news. And it's what our missionaries do, uh, what, what they go to share when they go on the mission field. It's what we share when we board a plane or we get in a car and we go to another location to share the good news on a mission trip. We're sharing the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And guess what happens when we share this good news? People hear the gospel. And many times, sometimes, people respond to the gospel. Lives are changed. Forgiveness is is freely given and salvation and peace are received. I was once on a mission trip in the nation of Brazil. I was outside of the nation's capital of Brasilia in a little community that really doesn't even appear on a map. It was actually a, a Baptist church that we had partnered with in that community And we were going through the community, our our mission team, door by door. You'd walk up to a house, sort of clap, and that would be the way you would let them know know someone was at their door, and they would come out and and begin to speak to you. Well, we we clapped at one particular door, and I only found out after the fact that the church member that was going along with me had chosen the particular house on purpose. You see, on this particular trip, we'd seen a number of people come to faith in Christ, far more than this local church had ever seen before. They were very excited, and this one particular church member decided uh, it would be a good thing to try to test to see how far God's powerful spirit would work in this mission effort that we were engaged in. And she knew of one particular household where there was a girl inside whose name was Hosanna, and Hosanna was known throughout the community as being a practitioner of voodoo. And she thought it'd be a really good thing to take the, the Baptist preacher from America to go to the door and see what God could do at that place. I had no idea. And so we, knocked, we sort of knocked the door, clapped at the door. A, an older woman answered the door. Through the interpreter, we explained to her why we were there. We had come from the United States. We were there to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And the woman in, 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 allowed us into the, into the room. Um, she inter, introduced us to her daughter and she disappeared. So we began to talk to this girl. Turns out this girl, her name was Hosanna, was the girl we were supposed to be there for. And we began to talk with her about Jesus and about how Jesus, who he was and why he had come into this world to die for her sins. And I said, you know, your name is Hosanna. Do you know what your name, what that means, what it's translated to me? It's a Bible name. She had no idea. 
I said, it means it's a cry for salvation. God, save us is what Hosanna means. She had no idea of this. I said, this is your name, and you're not living up to your name. You're not living up to, to the idea that you are a, a sinner desperate in need of salvation. I said, Hosanna, you need to cry out to Jesus and, and, and seek his forgiveness because because of your sins, you're going to die and be separated from him for all of eternity. And under the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit got a hold of Hosanna's heart. And she yielded her life to Christ. She, she sought God's forgiveness, became a Christian right there on the spot. What, and she told me, she said, you know, I cannot tell you, cannot describe, she said, all the peace that has entered into my, 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 my spirit, my person at this moment. I've never experienced this peace, but now that I've surrendered to Christ, I, I sense the peace of God. What we didn't know is that mother was in the next room listening the whole time. And as we began to share with her, she, uh, with Hosanna, mother was listening too. And Hosanna trusted Christ. And then after that, in comes mama says, I want Jesus too. And I'm telling you, it's the good news of Jesus. Amen? It's the good news of Jesus. It's why he has given us this gospel. And the good news is, Hosanna, God, we need you. Come save us. Redeem us. That's why he's calling us to go. So we go because we have a gospel to proclaim, a message to proclaim. And if we don't go, we cannot proclaim that message. But there's another reason why we go, and that's because we have an assignment to fulfill. See, Jesus, he died, he came back to life, and he did so for a very good reason. Verse 47 tells us that reason, that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. That's our assignment. We have the good news, but the good news is not just for us. But we are to proclaim that good news in his name to all the nations, beginning, as he says, from Jerusalem. In other words, we begin here in our local context, and, but it extends to the end of the earth. Verse 48 also says this, speaking to the assignment, you are witnesses of these things. See, Christian? Every one of you, every last one of us have an assignment. And the assignment is the same for all of us. It's not just for the missionaries that were on the stage here just a moment ago, but it's for all of us. We are all to be witnesses to the world about Jesus to proclaim the gospel. See, just before Jesus ascended into heaven, he made this statement in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In my former church, there was a man in our church, his name was Sam Ballou, he's a dentist, Dr. Sam, we, we referred to him as. He was a retired dentist by the time I had arrived there. He once told me, he said, you know, there was a time in my life I had a heart attack and I nearly died from the heart attack. And he said, I, I cried out to the Lord, I said, Lord, if you would just spare me and spare my life. He said, I'll spend the rest of my days going on mission trips and telling others about you. And the Lord spared his life and Sam followed through. Remember Dr. Sam, Jen? And, and I went on a mission trip with, with Sam one time, and he went on dozens of mission trips in his lifetime in the United States and abroad. Uh, he, even had a, he even had a heart attack on his last mission trip. Uh, and he said, it didn't matter. And he, he went anyway, and he, he, he had a heart attack, and he said, if I die on a mission field, then praise God, I died doing what God had called me to do. I remember being on one of those mission trips with Dr. Sam, and he was encouraging some of the mission trip participants, and he made this statement, paraphrasing Acts 1.8. He, he opened up his Bible, said, I'd like to read to you Acts 1.8, and he opened up his Bible, and we were from the city of Corbin in Kentucky, and he said this as he re began to paraphrase Acts 1.8. He says, you will be my witnesses in Corbin, in all Kentucky, and the United States, and to the ends of the earth. And I thought, he, he just misquoted. I said, no, no, he was just interpreting for us what we need to understand. He said, we, we, we can paraphrase that verse it, it, it for us in this way. You shall be my witnesses in Ocala and in all of Florida and the United States and to the ends of the earth. That is our assignment. It wasn't just an assignment for the apostles a long time ago, but this great commission, this commandment has been given to all of us. We are to proclaim the repentance for the forgiveness of sins to all the nations. That's our assignment. And it begins right here in Ocala. See, we've been called to reach the world for Jesus Christ. We begin here, but we do not end here. You know, as I, as I mentioned before, we're supporting the Shepherd's Church. And this, this idea of being in your context and, and, and ministering from your immediate context to the ends of the earth. 
was watching these Shepherd's Church members, and it was just amazing me. You know, we, we got on a plane, flew over to London, and spent a week getting on the mission field to, to help this church reach their community for Christ. But it just, it just dawned on me that they are on the mission field right where they are. That they are missionaries right there. And I'm thinking, how in the world can we board a plane fly all the way across the pond, go to the other part of the, of another part of the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to help somebody else reach their mission field, but we're not willing to do the same right here. See, this call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, the goal isn't the ends of the earth. The goal is to, to, to embrace the assignment of sharing the goodness of Jesus, his, his gospel, wherever we are, but it begins right here. This is much our mission feel right here. Now, someone may ask, you know, why do we go all the way to London to share the gospel when we have lost people right here in Ocala? I've, I've had people say that to me before <clears throat> in another context. You know, why do we spend all that money to go someplace else when we got lost people right here, Pastor? And, and that, no one said that, that to me anytime recently, but I will tell you, most often when someone complains that we're spending money to go someplace else when we got lost people right next to us, those people aren't sharing the gospel with the people right next to them. You see, it's not an either or, it's a both and. So let me answer the question. Why do we go to London or we go to Indonesia? We go to Peru or we go to Greece uh, to share Jesus when people in Ocala need him? Well, first we go to those places because Jesus wants us to go. He's called us to go. He gave us that in his commission. He wants the people there to know him. But also the reason we go to places like England or, or, or Peru is so that we can reach Ocala for Christ. Now, if that doesn't make much sense to you, let me explain it to you. You see, I have an, ul an ulterior motive when it comes to mission trips. <clears throat> you see, I, I want our mission trip members, when they go, I want them to develop a passion for reaching the lost. And I've discovered that when people actually get on planes and they get on boats and they get on buses and they go to another context and begin to share the gospel, I just know that if they could go there and see the work of God at work there, they'll want the work of God to happen here too. In other words, one of the reasons why we go, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons why we go is that we will find a passion there and we begin to live that passion out here. I see it happen all and over and over again. It's that I fear and I'm saying this with, uh, directing this as much to me as I am to anybody else. I, I seriously think that we do not have a passion for the lost people in Ocala. I really don't. And I, I, I'm saying that as much to me as, as anyone. It's almost like we've become spiritually immune to what's going on out there. We become immune to the spiritual conditions of the people around us, ignoring the consequences of, of what happens to a person if they die without Christ. It's almost as if we don't care about them. But if we could just get a few of you to step out of your comfort zone, to go to another context, to maybe go to a completely different location and, and allow God to use you there to reach the people there, you might develop a heart for the people right here in this community. And so here's what I hope to see. I hope to, to see more of you wanting to get out on mission in the days ahead. I'm going to see maybe, maybe we see 10 more people in 2025 choose to go on a mission trip than we had in 2024. And then maybe that, that 10 will come back here with a passion for the lost. And then maybe 20 more will go on a mission the, the following year. And, and we'll begin to double the mission trips that we're having and, and increasing the locations in which we are going. All the while, our passion to reach Ocala and the world is going to grow and to grow and to grow. You know, we began this year with our, our Vision Sunday and part of our emphasis on Vision Sunday was to talk about our worldwide mission effort. And we introduced a concept called from, the, from our neighborhoods to the nations. And this idea is, is that we want to be on mission, not just somewhere else, but right here in our community. And very soon you're going to begin to hear of opportunities for you to engage in local mission opportunities in our neighborhoods. You see, Christian, you have a task placed upon you. It is the, the call to proclaim the repentance for the forgiveness of sins to all the nations, and it begins right here. You know, and we're going to close out this service with a little statement that we often close out with. The last prayer will be prayed. You will stand up, but you'll hear this. You'll hear us say, 
you are Ah, you've been listening. And the idea is that the mission field isn't on the other side of the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean, but that the mission field is right outside these doors. And an assignment has been given to you, and it is to go. Why? Because your, heart, your God has a heart for people that go. Let me share with you one last reason why we go. We've talked about we we go because we have a message to proclaim and also we have an assignment to fulfill, which is to be witnesses, to proclaim the gospel. Here's the last one. This ought to be an encouragement to you. The reason why we go is because we have a promise of empowerment. You see, my voice is getting weak. You can see it, right? Um, Maybe it's just being, you know, in another climate coming back here. Even in my weakness... I know that the Spirit of God can do something, right? I've seen it over and over again, and, and we have a promise. We may feel weak when we, we go. We may not feel like we're completely prepared to share the gospel. We may have a challenge of, of fearing to say the wrong thing, or we may have some financial struggles that prevent us from getting on the field or something else. We just, we just come up with all kinds of excuses saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. But the Lord has promised His church that He's going to give his empowerment to reach the world. Let me, let me, let's be honest for a moment. Does the church today, the church in America, our church, does it, does, it, does it not feel like it's getting less and less powerful and more and more powerless and ineffective? Now listen, I know the church, and for many people, it's, it's fine with most people. It's a perfectly good place to have a wedding, to come when you have some, some struggle, you know. It's a, but it's, it's a far cry from the empowered church that we read about in the book of Acts. So what's wrong with the church today, especially in the Western context? What's wrong with this? Why don't we see thousands coming to faith in Christ like we've seen in previous generations? Why does it seem that God is moving among us like he used to move? Perhaps it's because we're not relying upon the promised empowerment of God that he promised to us a long time ago. We're relying upon our own strength and our own ability. And you know what the result of that is? That we're just a shadow of what we once were. Because we're, not, we're no longer familiar with the empowerment of God. We often choose not to share Jesus based upon our fears. And when we do, well, it's with less, desirable, less than desirable success. See, the Lord, our God, is a God who is on mission. And He's calling us to go with Him. And He wants all who will hear the gospel that He desires to be saved. He wants them to be saved. And He's empowered us in in order to, to, to see that happen. And if you think I'm just making this up, look at verse 49, the last verse. He says, And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power. From upon high. That power was mentioned in Acts 1 8. I read it earlier. That, that power that they were to wait upon when Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be, be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. If you know the story of the early church in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit arrives in grand fashion. And those, that, 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 that few grouping of believers that had gathered together were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And by the end of the day, 3,000 people had come to know Jesus by the end of that day. L- let me tell you what I've learned on mission. Because every time I've stepped out on mission, I find myself feeling a little less than adequate and prepared to go. And listen, I know I've got theological degrees and I've got experience and uh, I've, I've led evangelism programs and mission programs. And I'm telling you, Even I feel inadequate when I step out on the mission field. But let me just tell you what I've learned on being on mission. That the God of the book of Acts is still alive and well. And that he is still on the move and he is still sending his people to go. And that the Spirit of God is still active and is at work. You've heard testimony of my time when I was in in Warsaw uh, on a mission trip to to Poland on 9-11. Remember that story I've told you before? And how two or three days after our country was attacked here, uh, those, there was a, a team of pastors, and we, we were mourning for our country, and our, our mission uh, just seemed to have been blown up. And, and, and one of us had suggested, let's, you know, we, we need to, to grieve with our nation. We have an embassy here in Warsaw. Let's go down to the, to the U.S. embassy just to be close to our country somehow. 
And as we arrived, we had noticed that the Polish people had begun to bring flowers and, and candles and laid them out in front of the, the fence of the U.S. Embassy. We were moved deeply by the show of solidarity by the people there. And I don't know who began it, but someone in our group, one of the pastors, began to sing God Bless America. Interestingly enough, all of the pastors there uh, that day uh, from the United States, from Kentucky, we all could carry a tune. We just began to sing God Bless America. Uh, America. And we sang a few other songs and some of that began to change to, to some patriotic or to, away from patriotic songs to, to, to some hymns. But we began to notice that as we began to sing, the Polish people began to gather around us. They were just moved by our display of grief, but also our, our, our love for our nation. And, and as we finished the last song, one of us began to preach about Jesus, believe it or not. And and that turned into hundreds of gospel conversations that lasted for hours. But I, I kid you not, the Lord is my witness, over a hundred Polish people came to Christ standing outside of the, of the U.S. Embassy that day and the day after. And where did that come from? Is it because we, we could sing a good tune? It had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with the power, the Spirit of God in that moment. And people were touched by the power. We, we couldn't speak the language. We, we, we did the best that we could. And people, in, through their small understanding of, of English, uh, came to hear the gospel and responded in faith. I was on another mission trip. We were in a small village in a third world country. And we were going through, the, through a, a little square area in, in the, the, the city, in the center of the city. And we'd paused to rest in a Got on a motorcycle with a little carriage on the, on the back of his motorcycle, propane, he was carrying propane. Drove up, take a look at some directions or something, and we began to engage him in a conversation. Man in it, the young man ended up opening his heart to Jesus that day as we began to share the gospel with him. And he said, you know, he said, I wasn't supposed to come through here. I was supposed to pass by the street next to us, but the, the police had shut down the street and I only came over here because the street was shut down. He, he said, I don't know who caused the street to shut down. I was like, let me tell you who caused the street to shut down. <laughs> How do you describe it? You, you can call that coincidence. I call it the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And that was the empowerment of God. I didn't shut that street down. Our, 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 our interpreters didn't shut that street down. The Lord was at work there. It was actually in that same community that we were walking uh, along the street, encountered somebody on the street, began to share the gospel with somebody on the street. They, they didn't open their hearts to Christ. But as that, 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 that couple began to walk past us and we began to walk our way, somebody yelled out of a window next to the road where we were standing and said, hey, I'd like to talk with you. And we began to talk with them. We said, you know, that thing that you just shared with that person, I believe what you say. You see, it was an open window and somebody was eavesdropping to our conversation, heard the gospel, and came to faith in Christ. You think that was because I was an awesome gospel share? Of course not. That was because of the empowerment of the Spirit of God. Listen to me, Christian. The reason why we go is that we have been given this promise of empowerment. And listen, if you don't go, you can't experience that empowerment. Do you know that? God says, I'm going to give you power. He's going to empower us by the Spirit of God to, to proclaim the gospel. But you don't get to experience that empowerment unless you're willing to go. God gave us that empowerment. And the reason why is because he has a heart for the nations. And that's why we go. I, I wonder, do you have his heart? Do you have a heart to go? In this moment, I would challenge you to begin to study more, to look beyond this moment, begin to pray about the nations, to pray for those that are out there already embracing the call to, to, to share the gospel. Pray for people like Dave Seckington. Pray uh, for, for those who may need to go and have yet to respond. Give generously to missions. Give so that others may go. But also want to challenge you to go, to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. Maybe for the first time you're going to go on a mission trip ever. You've watched others go. Maybe you've even funded somebody to go. Maybe it's your time. I'd also challenge you to see that you have a mission field right here on, in Ocala to see what God can do for you and through you uh, as you begin to engage your lost neighbors and friends and co-workers and family members to, to gain a passion for the lost. 
And maybe the Lord is calling you to go. Maybe he's even calling you to uproot here and to go someplace else. I'm talking not just for a short-term mission trip, but to sell everything and go. Maybe you're called to go like Aaron and Amy Estelle, whom you, you, you met this morning. Or maybe you're to, to go like Bruce and Aaron the Point. Or maybe you're to go like Scott Belmore working with the university students in London. Or maybe you're called to go and, and to be a church planter. Imagine that someone among us may be called to leave this congregation and go someplace else to start a church uh, like Dave Seckington did in Shepherd's Bush. But I just wonder who's up next to go? Who's next? Maybe even now the Spirit of God is touching your heart. But also you may be thinking, you know, I'd like to go, but I, I just don't think I can go. I have work obligations. I've got family obligations. I can't afford it. I, maybe I'm too old. And th- those may or may not be valid reasons. That, that's for you to work out before the Lord. But before you dismiss it, let me let, 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 dismiss it out of hand. Let me, let me encourage you. Talk with one of your pastors about that. You may find that some of the obstacles that you find are big obstacles may not be obstacles at all. Let, let, let us help you sort that out and process those things. Some of those obstacles may not be obstacles. They may be opportunities. But listen. You do not have to go overseas to go. I'd hope that you could. Some of you should and some of you must, but but many are going to stay. But that doesn't mean that you cannot go on mission. The mission is right outside. The field is right outside these doors at your school, at your job, in your neighborhood. You just need to change your perspective of what going is. Going on mission is bearing the gospel wherever the Lord leads you. It may lead you to London, it may lead you to Indonesia, it may lead you to Peru, or it may just lead you out your front door to the sidewalk, you take a right-hand turn and go into the next sidewalk to the door of your neighbor. The mission field is out there. And remember, we go because the Lord Jesus Christ has that heart to go, and he has a heart for the nations. And you know who else the Lord has a heart for? The Lord has a heart for you. So I'm very well aware that not only did he send his son to die for the world, he sent his son to die for you, for your sin. And if you're here today and you've heard this and you've been thinking, man, I I want that. I want the forgiveness of God. I want to to know God and have a relationship with him. Well, this this call for us to extend God's gospel, the the invitation call to the world, this invitation is now being extended to you. And remember what I told you about the good news. The good news is simply this, that though we are sinners as human beings and do not deserve a relationship with God, we deserve to to be punished eternally for our sin, God sent his son to this earth. Jesus, who is God, perfect in everywhere, never committing one sin, laid down his life upon the cross. And when he died, he paid the penalty of our sin, but he didn't stay dead The good news is he also came up out of the grave, proving that he was who he said he was. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh, but also proving that he did what he came to accomplish, that he accomplished accomplished what he said he came to do, which is to pay the penalty of our sins. His death, burial, and resurrection is the good news because it is the means by which you can have a relationship with him, but you must repent. Believing in Jesus, you turn from your way of living And you turn to a life of following him, trusting him, believing in him. The one who has a heart for you is offering you this good news today. I'd like to close here this part of our worship service with a word of prayer. But I want to say to you, if you're here today and you would would like to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you how that's going to, uh, an opportunity that you have for you and how you could possibly see that happen. We're getting ready to take the Lord's table. And this, by the way, this, the Lord's Supper is, is for believers, those who have been baptized, a part of his church, believers in Jesus. And we're going to have some closing opportunity. But when we depart, you see the cross over to my right, to your left? One of our pastors is going to be standing at that cross at the conclusion of our time today. And if you're here today and, and you do not know Jesus, but you would like to, the invitation to you is this, is to trust Jesus Christ And our pastors are here to help you with that. You may have questions. Maybe you don't completely understand everything that's been explained to you today. We're going to have a long time available to us. We'll take as much time as we need to help you understand the truths of the gospel. Help you understand that today you can repent of your sins and find forgiveness in Jesus. 
and that pastor is going to be, avail- be available for you. When we close out our service today, please go to see that pastor, would you? Let me pray for you. Most Heavenly Father, I stand here as a man changed by the gospel. Lord, I'm grateful that a hundred years or so before I was ever born in this world, that someone took your word so very seriously, the word that is calling us to take the gospel to the nations, and they boarded a boat, crossed the Atlantic, and brought the gospel to this country. I will ne- this side of heaven will not know the names of those who gave so sacrificially of leaving family, friends, loved ones, resources, leaving it all behind and coming to a new country in order to see that the people in this country would have a- opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus. And Lord, I'm thankful for those who are willing to go because they brought the word, they brought the good news, the gospel took root in this, in this land Churches were planted and the gospel began to spread and new churches began to plant up and to to spread and the gospel spread and it spread not just geographically but also across time and that the gospel eventually came to a little eight-year-old boy in Owensboro, Kentucky. And because of that, Lord, my life has forever been changed. And so I'm grateful, Lord, for those who are willing to go to make sure that the gospel reached me. But now, Lord, the gospel having touched and impacted my life is now my responsibility is my assignment to be a witness that it's not supposed to end with me but I'm to pass this on to others and to keep doing so until you either you come back or you call me home and Lord this assignment is not exclusive to me as a pastor but it belongs to every person who has been touched by the gospel and changed by the grace of Christ and so Lord I pray that we will see a, a reigniting of revival among us and a desire to see the gospel shared not just in places like Shepherd Bush, but right here in Ocala. Lord, may we be a church that's on fire for you and re- willing to go. But Lord, I, nothing would encourage us more today than to see someone who just happened to come off the street or maybe visiting with a friend who's here today that had no idea that they were lost and separated from you but now that they've heard the gospel, that you would, you would love them and by your grace save them. And so, Lord, would you change a life today? Someone who is in the, in the dark spiritually could be brought into the light. And it's all because of what you did on the cross. And now that the good news of what you have done has been shared to them, I pray for the Holy Spirit of God to touch them and to draw them to yourself. Let it be, Lord, I pray. And give them encouragement to respond in faith. May it so be, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.